This is David Lehrer, and I'm welcoming you to, to America at a Crossroads on behalf of Community Advocates and Jews United for Democracy and Justice. You've seen our SCO sponsors on the screen for the past few minutes. We are grateful to them all, and uh, they've been terrific help. Tonight, I'm standing in for my partner, Janice Kamener Resnick, who usually welcomes you since she can't, since she won't be able to blush. I'd like to just say what a marvelous partner she is dedicated, tireless, and insightful. Uh, I also speak on behalf of the board of, of uh, Jews United for Democracy and Justice. Two of its members are introducers tonight. In addition, there is Rabbi Ken Chasen and Caroline Kennedy. Kelly, our calendar over the coming weeks remains filled, filled with timely and newsworthy worthy speakers. Next week, we'll host Professor Rick Hassan with KCRW's Warren Olney. Rick is one of the nation's leading authorities on election law, who just authored an important piece in Sunday's New York Times. And he is the, also the author of a just released book, Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons Our Politics, which will be the topic of discussion. The following week, March 30, we'll be joined by one of the most respected op-ed columnists in the country, E.J. Dion of the Washington Post. Larry Mantle of KPCC will interview Dion and Miles Rappaport, the co-author of their soon to be released book, 100% Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting. We have lots of important folks coming your way from a panel on the Alliance of Autocrats, Russia and China, and we'll have an evening on how to restore trust in journalism, and then we'll have a panel on Trump's legal woes. Remember to join us every Wednesday night. It should be terrific evenings all come up and down the line. And I have now the pleasure to introduce a key figure on the political scene of Southern <laughs> California for the past four and a half decades. A man committed to activism and doing the right thing, a member of the JUDJ Executive Committee, my friend, former supervisor, now UCLA professor, Zev Yaroslavsky. Zev? Thank you very much, David, and, and, and thank you also to Janice Kamen or Resnick. The two of you are the engines that make America at a crossroads a success, and we are all grateful to you for all that you do. First, let me take a moment to wish all of our viewers a happy Purim. The holiday, this holiday in the Jewish calendar commemorates an event in Persia some 2,500 years ago, which averted what would have been one of humanity's first genocides. Tonight and tomorrow, we commemorate our deliverance from evil at the hands of a merciless and genocidal tyrant whose plan was the annihilation of the Jewish people. Thanks to principled resistance, unyielding perseverance, loyal allies, and everlasting hope, the plan was foiled and good triumphed over evil. The story of Purim should not be lost on us this evening. Our prayer for our friends in Ukraine is that they find strength and hope in the Purim story in their hour of crisis. One of Purim's traditions is giving of gifts to those in need. Uh, what, on that note, I call your attention to our website where we've listed a number of nonprofit organizations who are providing assistance to Ukraine and its refugees in neighboring countries. You can help by donating to one of them and the sooner the better. Now turning to tonight's program, our moderator is Pat Morrison, a multiple Emmy and Gold, Gold Mike, Golden Mike Award winner and a fixture in Southern California journalism for many years. Public television station KCET here in Los Angeles, National Public Radio's KPCC and the Los Angeles Times have all featured Pat prominently as a unique voice in and about Southern California. She is also the author of several books most recently, Don't Stop the Presses, Truth, Justice, and the American Newspaper. Pat will be in conversation with our distinguished guest, Congressman Adam Schiff, who thanks to the decennial realignment of congressional district boundaries is now my congressman. Happy to have you here in the neighborhood. To introduce Adam, I turn it over to my lifelong friend and my partner here at America at a Crossroads, former Congressman Mel Levine. Mel, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Zeb. And I want to reiterate what you guys have been saying about what a pleasure it is to work with all of you. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce my longtime friend, Representative Adam Schiff. I believe that all Americans owe Adam a debt of thanks for how he has applied his courage, talent, and leadership in some of the most important legislative matters uh, in recent memory. As you all know, Adam was the lead prosecutor in the first Trump impeachment and his wisdom and leadership 
uh, that vitally important impeachment in many ways presaged the current vicious and shameful war Russia is waging against Ukraine. Had Adam and his colleagues not exposed the perfidy of President Trump, the Trump-Putin alliance could continue to further impact America and Ukraine. And Adam's engagement in the January 6th committee gives me confidence that the work of that committee will significantly strengthen the forces currently fighting to protect and preserve democracy in the United States. I'm delighted to turn this now over to Pat, who will interview Adam. Thank you, Mel, and thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. And thank you for JUDJ for organizing these so important discussions about issues that one overtakes the other. Three weeks ago, who would have imagined that we're talking about the Russian war waged against Ukraine? Congressman, 28th District, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's great to see you again, and uh, and I'm so delighted to, to be your representative, Zev. Um, uh, and uh, Mel, thank you for the kind words. So, Congressman, first Ukraine. We will talk about the committee's work, uh, the subcommittee's work shortly, but it's uppermost in people's mind. President Zelensky spoke to Congress today. What was the feeling like on the floor, the reaction from both sides of the aisle to a very emotional statement by this beleaguered president? Well, he was speaking to a, a deeply sympathetic audience to begin with, um, but uh, I think the power of his words, uh, as well as seeing those devastating images of Ukrainian cities uh, before and after their bombing, uh, the, the civilians that were being uh, murdered, um, one of the images that will never leave my head was the image of a father holding the hand of their deceased child under a sheet in the hospital. Um, and, uh, and I think the members were, were deeply moved. Um, uh, so I think it was a, a very important presentation, very powerful one, um, I think both to Congress and to the American people. You have, uh, there's been so much discussion about a no-fly zone. I understand you oppose it because of the tripwire that it might constitute to trigger Putin to escalate his war effort, but you do believe the Department of Defense needs to supply more aircraft and other material to the Ukrainians. Is that right? Yes, and uh, in terms of the no-fly zone, what people need to realize uh, in terms of what that would really involve is we would need to take out Russian anti-aircraft systems in Russia. So we would have to bomb part of Russia. Uh, we would have to take out Ukrainian planes and pilots, and they would try to take out American pilots. Um, and even then, uh, it wouldn't be the end of the air campaign against Ukraine. Uh, this is, I think, another um, misunderstanding. And that is those images that we saw today and that the American people saw, um, much of the, uh, the aerial bombardment has not been by Russian planes. Uh, it has been by Russian missiles and cruise missiles and artillery and rockets. Uh, and a no-fly zone doesn't prevent those things from entering Ukraine. Um, or at least it's not, uh, it's not uh, perfectly uh, capable of doing that. Um, and so uh, I think the, the reality is that uh, we are prepared to do everything we can short of getting in a shooting war with Russia. Uh, and establishing a no-fly zone would involve getting in a shooting war with Russia. But uh, short of that, I think we should do everything we can and uh, meet every need that uh, the Ukrainians expressed to us, including aircraft. There has been much pr uh, criticism from some quarters of President Biden for not acting more aggressively and going, for example, for a no-fly zone. But if we're looking at options that are still available for the United States to help Ukraine counter Russia, for the United States and NATO to help Ukraine counter Russia, I don't know how to put it in a percentage, but how many bullets are left in that gun? How many bullets have we not fired yet? Well, we first of all, we've done an awful lot in terms of military support and economic support for Ukraine. Uh, and beyond that, uh, the Biden administration, I think, has done a miraculous job in uniting our allies, NATO and even beyond NATO, to impose some of the most crushing sanctions on Russia. Uh, and, uh, and the administration has also very skillfully used uh, intelligence, uh, declassified it, 
um, to alert the world to what Putin was planning uh, to alert Ukrainians so that they could uh, defend themselves. Uh, I think part of the effect of that, although it didn't stop Russia from invading, was to strip naked the aggression uh, of the Russian military uh, and help develop that, uh, that uh, powerful consensus around these punishing economic sanctions. So I think the way the administration has handled all of this has been pretty flawless. Um, nonetheless, you're gonna get people uh, saying they need to do more. Um, I'm, I'm not satisfied uh, because Ukrainians are still dying uh, and I wanna do more, but that's not a criticism of the administration. I think they have handled this uh, with extraordinary speed and dexterity. Uh, and part of the criticism you hear in particular from Republicans, I have to say, uh, is pretty rich. Uh, these are by and large the same Republicans that excused um, Donald Trump when he was withholding military aid from Ukraine, which was even then in a shooting war with Russia, uh, and did so to try to extort this same wartime, now wartime hero Zelensky, try to extort him uh, into helping uh, him cheat in his election campaign. So um, I, uh, I think that we should take any GOP criticism with a very big grain of salt. Even though there was, um, I think, a, a unanimous ovation for uh, Zelensky today, perhaps unanimous, at least one of your colleagues has still been denouncing him as a thug sitting atop a nation of neo-Nazis. Not everybody is persuaded. Well, that's true. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that the miscalculation, there were many for Putin, was that that sentiment expressed by that one House member uh, and, uh, and what we heard uh, the former president say at the outbreak, calling Putin a genius. Um, I think the miscalculation by Putin was that that wasn't broader. Um, and because I think the takeaway that Putin had from that, uh, that prior action of the former president was to believe that America didn't care about Ukraine uh, and the Republican party in particular uh, wouldn't stand up to Putin or Russia. Uh, that it, it had too much of an affinity now for uh, the strong man. But as it turns out, uh, those voices are outliers. Uh, the biggest outlier is, is Tucker Carlson. And, you know, frankly, from my point of view, and he's, he's being rebroadcast re uh, on Russian television because it's such favorable propaganda. Uh, the last time I appeared on his show was about four years ago. Even then I told him he ought to move his show to RT because he was doing nothing but carrying Kremlin water. Now he literally is broadcast on RT. Um, and I think American companies not only should get out of Russia, but I think they should stop uh, sponsoring ads on Fox uh, while they're using one of the Kremlin propagandists in their prime time. That uh, so-called perfect phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky, the basis of one of the articles of impeachment, um, to what extent do you think the Trump's administration's actions or inactions vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine contribute to where Ukraine finds itself today? You know, I, I think to a, a tragic degree uh, for the reason I mentioned, which is uh, I think that it told Putin that vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, the United States, or at least the, the Republican Party didn't care. He could do what he wanted. Uh, if we were going to withhold military aid from Ukraine while they're fighting the Russians, to get help in a, a presidential election. Uh, we couldn't care much about the Ukrainian people or their democracy or the democratic aspirations. So I think that was his takeaway, uh, that this is where at least one of America's political parties was. Um, and I think uh, uh, tragically uh, that he expected too, when he went through with it, um, that, uh, that he would have the, the support of the former president who is still the leader of that party. Um, now, the, the bloody nature of this, the degree to which Ukrainians have successfully resisted uh, and the world is turning against Putin, is having the salutary effect of um, causing people to distance themselves from Putin, uh, including at times the former president, um, but also even wannabe dis despots like uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary. Um, and, you know, one of the, the effects that may come out of this, if we're fortunate, is that people are reminded of the horrors of authoritarianism. Uh, and people who are questioning whether democracy is really the right model, seeing now what authoritarianism really means 
uh, will once again come to reject uh, their flirtation with that, uh, that model. I'll move on to January 6th after this question, which is you use the phrase horror and horrific. It's almost as if with social media and television, we can watch 1938 and Germany all over again, happening all over again. Do you think it's the same? Are there any differences? Are there any um, exit ramps that we know better about how to use, how to take, how to advantage this time? Well, you know, I would say beginning early in the last administration, I really resisted the comparisons to the 1930s. Uh, but then I found I couldn't resist them any longer. Um, I was at the Munich National Security Conference just three weeks ago with a speaker. And uh, we heard President Zelensky at that time before the invasion, um, who was uh, equally powerful then uh, in his urging of, of action. Um, but I, I had a, a, a spare uh, hour or two and I walked down the street from my hotel to a museum in Munich uh, about the history of Munich. And reading about Munich in the 1930s, uh, reading the degree to which uh, a lot of the um, civic elite, a lot of the business elite were coming to embrace an authoritarian model. Uh, and they saw in this not so bright corporal, uh, someone who was very popular um, and someone who they felt they could use, in particular because he was popular and not very bright. Um, but of course, uh, he would come to completely dominate uh, that party uh, and the country. Um, and it was impossible to ignore the parallels to what we experienced in this country over the last several years. Uh, but now with, um, uh, with a, a country once again trying to remake the map of Europe by dint of military force in the most horrific way, we are brought right back to 1930s uh, Europe again. Um, now, I don't think the, the circumstances are, are the same. Um, and I don't think they will lead to the same place. I don't think they will lead to a world war. But it ought to shock us out of our lethargy um, about the need for NATO, uh, about the need for a community of democracies, and about the need to strengthen our own democracy here at home. Uh, one of those other images that was not part of the footage today, but, but stays with me, was the image of a Ukrainian man who looked like an older Ukrainian man throwing himself in front of a Russian tank. Um, and while we couldn't see what was happening in that tank, the tank would, would stop and then lurch forward and then stop again. And I, I could imagine a young Russian tank driver uh, because so many of those Russian troops are very young. Indeed, so many troops, period, are very young. Uh, I recall being in Iraq during the height of the surge and an American general in command telling me that we had 35,000 American teenagers in Iraq. Um, to underscore just how young uh, military forces are. But in watching that Ukrainian old man throwing his body in front of the tank, I was struck by, by his courage and what he was willing to sacrifice to protect his country and its sovereignty, to protect their democracy. Um, and I wondered what we were willing to do to defend ours. And what we're being asked to do is so much less, uh, but nonetheless, um, a very real need right now, because I think our own democracy, although threatened, not threatened by tanks, is very much under threat. Let's talk about the January 6th investigation. The committee's conducted nearly 750 depositions. It's gotten nearly 84,000 documents. So before, I know we'll get a lot of questions, but before we go into the particulars, can you describe briefly what the committee can and cannot do, its powers and the limits of its powers? Well, what we can do is we can expose the facts uh, and we can produce recommendations about how to prevent uh, this from ever happening again. That's really our charter. Um, we are, uh, and we, we will do that by uh, beginning, I think in a couple months, hosting a series of public hearings uh, in prime time to basically tell the story, not just of the sixth, but importantly of the multiple lines of effort to overturn the last election. Uh, the six was only the violent culmination of those efforts. Those in efforts involved uh, trying to decapitate the leadership of the Justice Department and use it to promulgate uh, bogus claims of fraud. Uh, it involved uh, multifarious and baseless litigation around the country. It involved proposals to seize, uh, have the federal government seize voting machines 
involved effort to intimidate uh, state and local elections officials, including a notorious call b- between the former president and the secretary of state in Georgia, where he asked the secretary, demanded really, that the secretary find 11,780 votes that don't exist. Um, so it's our job, I think, to expose those things in the most uh, um, uh, visual way, um, in, the, in the way that will most engage the American people. Um, ultimately, to write the definitive report about what happened, which I view as more of an historic document, um, and, and to make those recommendations and to protect us going forward. It is not our role to prosecute those responsible. That's the Justice Department's role. Uh, and in this, I'll be candid, I have concerns, I have deep concerns. I think the Justice Department is doing what it should with respect to people who physically attacked the Capitol uh, and a few of the people who organized that attack. But I see no indication by the department that it is investigating those other multiple lines of effort to overturn the election, some of which I believe involve criminality. Uh, and most particularly that effort by the former president in Georgia. I think if anyone else on this Zoom were on that phone in a recorded conversation, um, telling uh, the secretary to find exactly the same number of votes that he needed to win, um, and not one more, um, we would be under investigation. It should be no different for Donald Trump, but it is. Uh, Yes, he's under investigation by the Fulton County District Attorney. But I can tell you, having spent almost six years in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles, the Justice Department does not defer to a local DA's office in a case of national significance. That's not what's going on here. Um, And I can tell you also, the Justice Department isn't sitting around waiting for a criminal referral from our committee, although we may send them referrals. They don't do that either. Um, That's not their job to wait for Congress to recommend who should be prosecuted or investigated. Uh, I think they are failing to act uh, with uh, out of an excess of caution and not wanting to embroil the department in controversy. And while I can understand that, believe me, I've been involved in controversy uh, as as the head of the Intelligence Committee uh, and it ain't for the faint of heart. But I also think that we cannot have a situation where Uh, The Justice Department maintains you can't investigate or prosecute a sitting president. Um, And as a constitutional matter, which I think is a flawed interpretation of the Constitution, but then also take the position that you can't investigate or prosecute a former president either, because that would be too controversial or appear too political. Um, If the rule of law is to apply equally, it must apply equally, including to former presidents. The Justice Department has gone after a lot of low-hanging fruit. There have been any number of prosecutions, as you say, of the people who were physically on the premises. And earlier this month, there was a court filing from the committee claiming that there is evidence that President Trump broke the law and could have amounted to, and perhaps did amount to, a criminal conspiracy. Um, Given that and the material that is available to the Justice Department, and the fact that there's an urgency involving the November elections when the House may change hands. What do you foresee as some kind of schedule and outcome or intent at least as this goes forward apropos of President Trump, his family and others at the top of that tree with the low hanging fruit that's already been snagged at the bottom? Well, the, the litigation you're referring to is, is actually in California. It involves uh, some, an attorney named John Eastman Um, who also has a role at Chapman University. Um, Eastman was involved uh, in trying to uh, pressure the vice president um, to uh, refuse to do his constitutional duty uh, and certify the result uh, and push this uh, bogus legal theory that the vice president could refuse to accept certain slates of electors. Um, He wrote a lot of his emails apparently on the Chapman University system. Uh, which we have subpoenaed, and he has uh, sued us to stop that from happening. The judge in that case um, asked us uh, uh, essentially to brief the court on whether the crime fraud exception applies. Uh, He is claiming that he is an attorney representing the president and therefore his communications cannot be viewed or uh, produced. Um, We don't think he's an attorney representing the president, so that's one issue. Um, But another issue is Um, If you're engaged in communications with a client over how to engage in criminal activity, it is not protected under that privilege. 
Uh, and so uh, we made the, the sufficient showing to the court to get the court to review those emails, uh, what's called in camera, um, privately, uh, and then make a determination of whether they should be turned over. But the, the criminality, the potential criminality that we pointed to was, was three different laws. <clears throat> One uh, that makes it a crime to interfere with an official proceeding. Um, the joint session of Congress was nothing if not an official proceeding. Uh, and the question was, um, did Donald Trump and his campaign attempt to interfere in that proceeding? And I think there is certainly uh, ample evidence to warrant a criminal investigation on that score. Um, we also, uh, um, in this pleading, made it clear that we think that uh, there's evidence that uh, the president and his campaign also violated the statute that makes it a crime to conspire to defraud. Uh, and finally, there is a common law uh, fraud, uh, fraud uh, law as well. And we believe the president and his campaign may have violated. Um, those were the issues implicated by those documents, uh, we believed. But there are other um, issues that we weren't briefing to the court, such as what the president did with respect to Georgia. Um, and where I think that there is already in the public domain um, ample evidence that warrants a criminal investigation. In my feeling on this, uh, just to wrap up, Pat, is the Justice Department needs to investigate credible allegations of criminality, whether they're by the former president or anyone else. The, 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 you, internal can then make, the, the Attorney General can then make a prudential judgment about what to do with those cases. But I As don't think can simply refuse to investigate. I'm sorry, as to my question about urgency with the possible changing hands of, of the House, the Justice Department under Merrick Garland will go on through the Biden administration, but what happens to the material, to the nature of the investigation by the House, even by these hearings that you're talking about, if the House were to change hands, would that come to a shuddering halt? Well, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yes, um, if the, the House were to change hands, um, the Republicans would do one of two things. They would dissolve the committee. And actually, the committee would dissolve in of itself because it's only authorized for this, the current session. So they would refuse to reauthorize the committee or they would reauthorize it, but repurpose it um, to promulgate the same phony claims of fraud uh, that are the subject of the investigation. Um, but in terms of our committee's work, uh, we fully intend uh, to uh, have our hearings produce our report before we ever get to that. Um, and so we will have conducted and I would expect completed most of our work, um, uh, you know, before uh, there, there's even a midterm election or before the end of the year. Uh, so um, I, th I think we understand uh, uh, the urgency and the urgency, frankly, has more to do with wanting to make sure that we prevent this from happening again than any other uh, clock that may be ticking. One of your great concerns is the state of democracy itself. And we see across the country, state after state with restrictive voting laws now that the, uh, the Voting Rights Act has been watered down by the Supreme Court. We see states taking power over elections out of the hands of secretaries of state who were responsible for it and putting it in the hands of partisan legislators. Rich asks a question about Ukraine and the state of democracy in the world. It may be a very clarifying moment right now for democracy itself and the future of democracy. Do you see these two issues being conflated and is Ukraine a point, a case in point that we can look to in this country that someone like you can argue effectively when you try to challenge these limitations on the public voting right, on the change of power and who decides elections, not the voters, but the politicians? Uh, yes, I, I think you can draw very clear connections between the struggle for um, uh, sovereignty and self-determination and democracy in Ukraine and our own struggle here at home. Uh, and you can also point to some of the same challenges. Uh, while we're not facing Russian tanks, we are facing Russian propaganda. Um, we have Russian interference in our 2016 election designed both to elect someone that the Kremlin thought would be favorable to Putin, but also with an eye to uh, pitting Americans against other Americans. Um, and the kind of propaganda we saw in 2016, we would see repeated in 2020. In 2016, among the propaganda um, pushed out by the Kremlin 
was that Hillary Clinton was in poor health. Uh, this was a propaganda that was amplifying a Trump campaign message. Uh, and similarly, after the 2020 election, the Kremlin continued to try to undermine our democracy by amplifying the former president's false claims of fraud. They do that still. Um, in the 2020 election, they amplified claims that Biden wasn't well. Um, once again, um, seizing on uh, one campaign's narrative to attack the other. Um, and so, uh, you know, Russia has interfered in our dem democracy, not just Ukraine's, using some of the same tactics, not the military ones. Um, but, uh, but more than that, the, the, the degree to which the GOP has used this big lie about our elections to usher in those Jim Crow laws, to attack the infrastructure of our elections, with so many people running for elections office now, secretary of state positions, local county elections offices, who are promulgators of the big lie, puts our own democracy deeply at risk. Uh, and I would hope that, that Ukraine is a cautionary tale for us uh, of where authoritarianism leads. Um, and, uh, and I hope that Russia's malevolence so, so nakedly visible in Ukraine will cause both parties in America to repudiate any further Russian interference in our affairs, no matter which side it may help or hurt in the next presidential election. Because voting rights, voting results are under assault in so many directions, um, you call the multiple points of failure. Um, at, at South by Southwest earlier this week, you said, look, this was a very close thing. If Kevin McCarthy had been Speaker of the House, our democracy would have failed because they would have overturned the election in the House. Do you see any of that sentiment retreating or has it been doubled down on? Well, you know, sadly, um, in terms of the House and Senate, I, I see no, um, no reconsideration of the terrible direction that the Trump GOP is headed. Uh, that is, um, yes, they are parting company with Putin. Most of them, not all of them, but most of them are parting company with Putin. They are not parting company with their strategy of weakening our democracy, of undermining voting rights. Uh, that goes on. Um, indeed, that has been the political business model of Mitch McConnell's for quite some time. Uh, it didn't begin with Donald Trump, but it has intensified. Um, the Republican Party leadership in Congress believes that if more Americans vote, they will lose. Uh, and in particular, if more people of color vote, they will lose. Uh, and, you know, the insidious uh, um, uh, synergy between that McConnell business model and McCarthy business model and Donald Trump is Donald Trump um, persuaded uh, uh, a certain number of Americans that not only um, would their party lose if people of color voted, but they would also be illegitimate. Uh, if people of color voted and it made a difference in deciding the outcome, that it would be illegitimate. Um, and, and, and in using race in that nefarious way, um, uh, it's done enormous damage. Uh, I mean, of all the terrible images of January 6th, among the worst for me was the, the, the sight of those Confederate flags in the Capitol and those Auschwitz t-shirts. Because that, that told me that this was not just a Trumpist insurrection, it was also a white nationalist insurrection. Uh, and that the road back to this country would be much longer and harder than I thought it would be. Um, those things haven't receded. Um, those things move apace. Uh, and in that sense, at least in the GOP, there is a real still disconnect between what they see in Putin's Russia um, and what they're doing at home. There's always been that anti-government resistance in this country, whether it's over taxes or privacy questions. And now they've all been able to conflate and to join forces in no small part because of social media. And there has been some discussion about how social media has been an amplifier and not a responsible one. And discussion as well about changing, I think it's called uh, section, is it section 230, is that the number right? That mm -hmm. absolved social media providers 
from the same responsibilities that publishers or television or radio station voices have to be responsible for the content, the veracity to some extent of the content that they put out there. Is that one solution to this? I think it is, it's part of the answer. Um, that, uh, that immunity in section 230 was given to these um, technology companies for a couple of reasons. One, we didn't want to stifle innovation when they were a nascent industry. Well, they're not a nascent industry anymore. We also though, wanted to encourage them with that immunity to moderate their content. Uh, they made the argument successfully that, you know, we want to be able to take down content that offends our users, but we're afraid if we do that, we'll get sued. And so we gave them immunity to be good corporate citizens, but they haven't used it that way. They've used it instead to shield uh, liability when they're bad actors. Um, and, and so either getting rid of Section 230 or at least cabining Section 230 to only provide immunity if, for example, they stop setting their algorithms to amplify for what they call engagement, but what really means amplifying anger and fear and lies and conspiracy theories. Um, it, it, they shouldn't enjoy any immunity if that's how they're going to set their algorithms. Uh, so I think that is part of the answer. It's not a complete answer um, by any means because not only is it not a cure-all for social media, it doesn't impact at all what you see in other media. Um, you know, Fox, uh, you know, uh, people rightly uh, have raised the issue that Facebook did away with its civic integrity unit after the election. We saw a lot of the problems rematerialize. Um, well, Fox has no civic integrity unit. Um, if they did, uh, you know, several of their biggest money-making shows wouldn't be aired. Um, and, and there is no Section 230 uh, that is protecting Fox from what it does. There's also no fairness doctrine uh, that we could impose because we could have a fairness doctrine when uh, people got their news from broadcast TV and because the public owned the airwaves. Uh, but with these private pipelines, that provide our cable news, uh, there is no way to impose a fairness doctrine. Uh, and so uh, repealing section 230 doesn't do much about that. Um, and it doesn't do much about other information bubbles like conservative talk radio. Um, we are really gonna have to figure out um, how to get past this stove piping of information in this country uh, because it is polarizing our politics, it is dividing us and it's weakening us as a nation. Before we get to the questions from the people in our audience, of whom there are 5,000, the audience, not the questions, so don't worry about that part. Um, the, the midterm elections are also in many ways always a referendum on the occupant of the White House. There's been criticism from the left that President Biden has not been aggressive enough on a lot of items on the domestic agenda. Um, and there's also been his fruitless negotiations with Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, the Democrats in the House, the nominal Democrat, or the Senate, excuse me, nominal as far as many people are concerned. The debacle in Afghanistan has given an opening to his critics. How would you rank him in, as he enters, is a couple of months into his second year in office? Well, I would, I would give him very high uh, rankings to be candid. Um, what we have been able to accomplish uh, is extraordinary for the first year and a quarter of a new administration. Um, we passed a rescue plan that uh, helped us emerge from this pandemic, uh, helped us vaccinate uh, now two thirds of America, um, helped us save millions of small businesses and uh, keep families afloat. Um, that was a remarkable accomplishment. Uh, we passed one of the most significant infrastructure bills uh, in history. Uh, after four years of infrastructure week with no infrastructure, we passed something that will rebuild, rebuild our roads and our highways, uh, our, our renewable energy grid and more. Uh, so that's a pretty remarkable record of achievement to bring the economy back from the abyss, um, to lower unemployment more rapidly than anyone anticipated, to have stronger economic growth than China, um, to create uh, six and a half million jobs uh, in his first year. So the president has a lot to be proud of. Um, where I think we have fallen down, frankly, is we've been poor messengers. Um, we didn't sufficiently make the case of what we did in that uh, rescue plan. Uh, so most Americans aren't aware of what we did. 
to help uh, bring this economy back, um, uh, as well as uh, bring back the, the health of the American people. Um, and, uh, and the American people still don't know yet uh, how their communities are gonna be impacted by the infrastructure bill. Uh, there's a third bill that I think we will get to yes on this session, which is um, the America Competes Act, which will be the most significant investment in bringing manufacturing back home. Um, and uh, in particular, high-tech manufacturing like semiconductors, uh, the absence of which has contributed uh, to inflation. Uh, so um, I think we need to tell a far better story of what we've accomplished. Um, and I think the problem where I would give not just the president, but where I would give our party deficient arcs is not in our record of accomplishment, but rather in our messaging. Um, this has been a perennial challenge for the Democratic Party. Um, and, uh, and we are very much focused on that. We recognize that it's a deficiency uh, and we're determined to, to make sure that we um, get our message down uh, and do it ASAP because I think that's uh, gonna be key going into those midterms. It seems like Democrats always wanna have bumper stickers with footnotes. Yes, and you know the, the Republicans do a very good job uh, pejoratizing us. Um, their message is the Democrats are nothing but socialists who want to defund the police and do nothing but teach critical race theory all day. Um, none of that is true, but, uh, but they, they have an advantage. They have a couple of advantages we don't have when it comes to the message. The first is they have Fox, uh, which is essentially like state-run TV for the Republican Party. Uh, and you might say that MSNBC is progressive and what about CNN? Those are news agencies that are more than willing to be critical of Democrats and are. Um, but the other advantage they have is they are a very homogeneous party. Um, frankly, that all looks like me. They're all middle-aged or older white men um, where it's easy to maintain a certain homogeneity in their message. Uh, we are an incredibly diverse party. That is our strength in every way except probably message. Um, but we're, we're simply gonna have to be far more disciplined about it. We get that uh, and, uh, and we're gonna have to do it ASAP. Let's get to some questions, Congressman. We'll be topic hopping as you would expect. Um, let's see, Judy wants to know why we wouldn't su supply Ukraine with the same Iron Dome technology that Israel has used so effectively in repelling air attacks. I, I suspect the, the reason is, well, first of all, we would need uh, uh, to work with Israel on that. Uh, Israel is in a very difficult position uh, because Israel relies on Russia for uh, whatever sorties Israel needs to do into Syria uh, to take out threats to Israel uh, because Russia has air defense systems where they can take out Israeli aircraft. Uh, so Israel's in a pretty difficult position. But more than that, um, what, we, what Ukraine really needs are anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems that it knows how to operate. Um, it, it's probably not practical to be training Ukrainians on systems they haven't used. Um, so I don't want to say that, that, uh, that, that anything is ruled out at this point. Um, we don't know how long uh, and terrible this conflict may be, but I think in the most immediate term, the need is for systems they know how to use, they're familiar with, and that can be very efficacious in shooting down Russian aircraft. Ali has a question that I think we can also extend to the matter of refugees, which is one question I get from friends is why we're intervening in Ukraine, but not other places. How would you best explain how this is different? Yeah, well, you know, I think it's a very important question. Um, uh, we, you know, we did intervene uh, to some degree in Syria um, to try to prevent humanita humanitarian catastrophe there. We likewise intervened uh, in other places for the same reason. And sometimes we've intervened for national security reasons and sometimes we've gotten that horribly wrong. Um, I think in the case of Ukraine, what makes Ukraine particularly important is a couple of things. First, in 1994, the United States, Britain and Russia um, agreed that if Ukraine would give up its Soviet era nuclear weapons, that we would assure its territorial integrity and sovereignty. Um, and Ukraine did. And, uh, and, and tragically, had Ukraine hung on to those nuclear weapons, it would probably not be in the position it is in today. 
Uh, so we- and Russia made the same pledge not to invade its sovereignty. Yes, yes, so we see how much that's worth to Russia. But it ought to be worth something to us. Um, in particular, when, when we have an incentive in denuclearization around the world, um, there needs to be a, a different way that countries can assure they won't be invaded. Um, and, and so both because this is a commitment that we made, but also because one of the reasons that Russia has invaded Ukraine, one of the reasons that Ukraine and Putin views is so pivotal is that Putin is terrified of these color revolutions that swept the world. Um, he's not worried about losing a democratic election in Russia because there really aren't democratic elections in Russia. What he is worried about is the ability of people to gather in massive numbers and overthrow their oppressive regimes, as we saw take place around the world, and as took place in Ukraine with the Orange Revolution, or what they call the Revolution of Dignity, in which they threw out a Kremlin-backed, corrupt strongman. Um, and when that happened on Russia's doorstep, that was a terrifying thing for Putin. Uh, and so I think he views this um, indeed, his efforts to prop up Assad in Syria are as much about propping up autocracy in his own regime uh, and trying to combat democracy and, um, and, and democratization as anything else. And so we have a deep interest, I think, uh, in defending that democracy um, as it is a part of defending our own. Let's get to a few more questions in the time we have. And this almost reminds me of the old domino theory. Uh, Tom asks uh, whether Putin is thought to have had still designs on Moldova, on Romania, on Latvia, on the Baltic states, even Poland, and will use the nuclear card to avoid a response from NATO and the US. Should we not address that issue now in Ukraine? Uh, you know, it's a good question. Um, I think that uh, I don't think we can address that in Ukraine if by that you mean we trigger Article 5 uh, and declare war on Russia uh, because it has invaded a country that we would treat like it was an Article 5 nation. Um, but does he have designs on these other places? Yes. Um, I mean, he clearly had designs on Georgia and now um, they have occupied part of Georgia and created this, these rump areas in Georgia. Uh, they have done the same thing uh, in other places as well, freezing conflicts in place uh, to extend their influence. I mean, part of what is motivating Putin in Ukraine is this desire to be Peter the Great, uh, to rebuild uh, what he once described in the dissolution of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical disaster of his lifetime. So um, the danger is if he were to succeed in Ukraine, uh, particularly if he had succeeded in the manner in which he thought, which was to quickly overrun um, Ukraine and install a puppet and essentially uh, run Ukraine uh, by proxy. Um, and if the rest of the world had been disunited and weak and dithering, um, it would have certainly been an encouragement for him in other places. Now, whether he would have gone into a NATO country, I don't know. Um, but it, it would certainly have emboldened him. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, we have the same reasons to make sure that this is a costly, tragic failure for Russia um, if we want to deter that other ambition. On that point, if you can get answer this quickly and we'll move back to January 6th, um, Francis wants to know, um, how can we feel comfortable knowing we're not starving innocent Russians as we put sanctions on that country? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't think we can feel uh, comfortable or confident uh, that we're not starving Russians. Um, uh, the consequences will be severe. Um, but uh, there's no alternative, I think, to um, letting the Russian people know the, the terrible folly of their regime. Um, and uh, without the Russian people being able to feel the pain themselves, I don't see how Putin has any incentive to stop what he's doing. Yeah, he's clearly um, mindless, careless of what the rest of the world thinks. Uh, and so um, it will hit Russians hard. It will hit poor Russians even harder. Um, hopefully, uh, if we're successful in what we're trying to do, it will hit the oligarchs, the oligarchs hard as well. 
Apropos of January 6th, um, Timothy asks about rumblings that I have heard and whether there are any plans to disqualify from holding or seeking office the members of Congress who supported the insurrection as per Amendment 14, Section 3. Um, I, I think as a practical matter, the answer is no. Um, uh, that would be quite unprecedented. Uh, and um, I just don't know that there is the appetite to do that. Um, uh, so I, I don't think that's going to be a remedy here. Um, much as I think that uh, uh, any number of my colleagues qualify uh, under the language of, of that amendment. And, and, and in fact, even short of the amendment, there is statutory language that allows for disqualification um, for uh, support of an insurgency. Uh, and so um, I, I, it's not that I think it's with, without uh, legal basis, but I, I think uh, already given the dysfunctional state of the Congress, um, there are concerns with making it even more dysfunctional. Barbara asked a question that has also been recently uppermost in a lot of people's minds, which is China's relationship with Russia in this as a partner, as a, a passive bystander who would not join other nations in the world in some of the sanctions and enforcement. And it's a topic that will be addressed here, I think, in a few weeks in a program that's being organized now. But from your point of view, how do you see China's engagement or its disengagement in all of this? I think China views this through really two lenses. The first is uh, Taiwan. What does this mean to their plans for Taiwan? Uh, what does this mean if they, they uh, ultimately invade Taiwan? Which is something that is you know, far more likely a prospect than I would have thought uh, some years ago. Um, I think uh, in the way that uh, Putin views Ukraine as part of his legacy, she may view Taiwan as part of his. Um, and so uh, I think what uh, China is watching is, and watching I think with dismay, is the degree to which the United States and NATO quickly rallied to punish Russia. Um, and in an imposing sanctions on ourselves in a way by at a time of historically high gas prices, cutting off Russian oil and gas, we're also telling China, we're willing to sacrifice ourselves, not just sacrifice other, uh, others' interests. Um, that has to be a deterrent to China. Um, the other thing that uh, China is discovering to its dismay is how vigorously Ukraine is resisting and how even a much smaller, lesser power with the will to fight can hold off a bigger, stronger one. That too has to temper Chinese uh, enthusiasm uh, regarding Taiwan. Um, but, uh, but the countervailing uh, factor is, as NATO has come together, as the US and the West have come together, uh, I think that she views Putin um, as part of a community of autocracies in the same way we, we view the community of democracies. Um, and it has created a, a, an interest in drawing closer between Russia and China um, um, in the hopes of fending off a democratic rules-based order. So that has drawn them closer together. Um, now, I, I, finally, I would say that I think, again, the administration is very shrewdly making public what it is seeing. And by making public a Russian request for Chinese weapons and support, um, they are putting China on notice that if it gets involved in helping Ukraine militarily, um, it will have blood on its hands. And the stain and the stigma of what Putin is doing will wash over China and Xi. Um, and I think that's a very important message because China is sensitive to how Putin has become a pariah. Uh, and you even saw one prominent Chinese columnist bravely write that it would be folly and a mistake for China to get in bed with Russia in this war in Ukraine, uh, that was quickly censored, but nonetheless, it was impressive that it was published at all. Congressman, in 30 seconds, many people are eager to know they have their calendars open. When will the hearings be televised that we were speaking about with January 6th? You know, I think our chairman um, said as recently as today that uh, while we had hoped to begin in April, they'll probably begin in May. Uh, and the reason for that is we really want to finish as much as we can our interviews and depositions so that those witnesses don't have the benefit 
of the testimony in public session um, because we, we think they'll be more candid if they don't know how much we know. Congressman Adam Schiff, the 28th district in Los Angeles, which includes one of our supporters and guides, former supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky. It's always a pleasure. I hope next time we can have you back to talk about more domestic issues as they certainly will loom large and have been on the horizon. Thank you, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, great to be with you. We wanna remind you that next week, Rick Hassan and Warren only talk about Rick's new book, Cheap Speech, How Disinformation Poisons uh, Our Politics and How to Cure It. That's next Wednesday, March 23rd at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Thank all of you for tuning in and watching. Wish you a special good health and now more than ever, stay safe.